Okay, so our next speaker is Nico Brinkman from uh, University College London. So he's going to be talking, as you can see from his slide, on quantum LDPC subsystem code constructions. I won't read the full title. It's another, another, another notable fact about Nico is that he's currently running these QCPA seminars. We're taking a break from them at the moment, but they happen every other week and they're on a similar topic to FTQT. Every Monday, uh, uh, what is it? 6 p.m. Central European time, I think. 5 p.m. Central European time, something like that. Um, but he's got a good mailing list that you can subscribe to if you want to come to any of those talks, seminars that he organizes. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Earl. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, the organizers, Earl, Barbara, and uh, Steve, for um, yeah, pu pulling this off uh, despite uh, the pandemic. Um, yeah, regarding the, the, the QCDA meeting, uh, just very shortly, uh, if you're interested in joining, then just uh, shoot me an email and I will add you to the mailing list. Uh, yeah, so as, as Earl already kind of uh, mentioned, I kind of cheated and kind of put a full abstract into my title. Um, so I will talk about um, uh, two things in particular. Um, one is a construction of uh, subsystem codes and the other is um, how to use these subsystem codes um, uh, more efficiently uh, by using ideas for gauge tracing. And this is, uh, this is joint work with uh, Oscar Hickett, uh, who is a PhD student uh, supervised at UCL. Okay, so let me first talk a bit about the uh, motivation. Um, let me just shuffle the participants a bit out of the way so I can read. Um, so um, we know that uh, there are some interesting classes of quantum codes uh, which have a large check weight. And by large, I mean uh, more than uh, four qubits participating in a check. And uh, coincidentally, all I can think of uh, were ones which started with the letter H. So let's start with high dimensional homological codes. Uh, we have seen those uh, luckily already yesterday uh, in the nice talk by Thomas. Um, another class are hyperbolic codes, um, uh, which I will feature a bit more prominently in this work. Uh, you can also uh, combine these two and look at higher dimensional uh, hyperbolic codes, which have interesting properties and which were um, uh, first suggested by uh, Guth and Lubotsky. And, um, uh, yeah, and th those have uh, some, some nice properties. Uh, and then there are also hypergraph product codes, uh, which were um, introduced by uh, Tillich and Seymour. And uh, I think uh, this will also feature in uh, Seymour's talk later in the workshop. And um, this work, uh, first of all, um, tries to find a way uh, to reduce uh, the check weights um, of such codes. Um, um, ideally by keeping their, their core properties. Um, and this is the subsystem uh, construction. And then the second part uh, tries to improve um, the error correction capabilities uh, using gauge fixing. Okay, before um, we can, uh, I, I dive into this, uh, let me just kind of uh, set, uh, uh, set the stage a little bit. Um, so first of all, um, uh, I, I assume that uh, people are aware of stabilizer codes. Um, so these are defined as subgroups of the polygroup acting on n uh, qubits. Um, and they define uh, a, a code uh, space, um, which is uh, simply the um, subspace of the Hilbert space, uh, which is fixed uh, point-wise, meaning that uh, each element uh, is fixed exactly by the action of uh, the stabilizer group. Um, the code space itself is fixed as a whole um, uh, by a, a larger group called the logical uh, group, uh, denoted L. And L is the uh, normalizer of the stabilizer subgroup. And um, they kind of sit um, in this kind of Matryoshka fashion uh, in, the, uh, in the poly group. So we have uh, uh, S, um, which is uh, an abelian group. Um, I should mention this S has to be abelian for, for this definition to make sense. And this sits inside the, the logical group, which sits inside the uh, poly group. Um, so this uh, idea can be generalized uh, uh, slightly by um, introducing something called a gauge group, uh, which is noted uh, G. Um, and uh, we define the stabilizers as the center of the gauge group. So the center is the um, uh, is a um, group uh, of all elements which commute with all elements in G. And if you look at the uh, a similar um, diagram um, as before, we see that there's the uh, poly group and we have our gauge group. Then we has, have S kind of sitting in there. And then we have um, our logicals sitting like this. Um, this uh, um, 
type of code was uh, uh, introduced by Poulin in 2005. Um, and um, yeah, and this is kind of like the, the, what, what the algebra kind of looks like. Uh, so you might wonder, just looking at this at this picture, um, uh, you might wonder uh, why we would uh, introduce these um, these gauge operators in the in the first place. Um, in some sense, if we would kind of you know, just take the union of G and L, we would just have a, a larger logical group. Um, so we have essentially we have some some degrees of freedom, and uh, which we just kind of denote uh, gauge instead of logical and um, uh, in general, uh, we won't use them to encode any information. So essentially, you can think of, of, the, of the gauge degrees of freedom as logical degrees of freedom, which we don't use to encode any quantum information. Um, so why, why would we want to do this? Uh, like, why would we want to uh, waste resources uh, um, encoding degrees of freedom that we, that we don't use? Uh, in particular, because physical qubits are certainly expensive and rare, so we want to have uh, Low overheads when we when we encode stuff more tolerantly, um, and uh, one of the big reasons is that uh, gauge qubits can help with syndrome measurement. Um, so uh, the way this works is that um, some uh, subsystem codes um, have um, stabilizer checks, which are products of uh, of lower weight uh, gauge operators. So let's say we have some stabilizer check S. Uh, then this can be written as a product of uh, gauge operators, uh, GI. Let's say S has very high weight, uh, but the GI have low weight. Um, then measuring the, the GI individually and multiplying the results, uh, we get the, uh, the same result as measuring like this high weight uh, stabilizer check. Um, one example of, of this, or maybe the most famous example, is the Bacon Shaw code, uh, which is defined on a square lattice with qubits on these vertices. Um, the stabilizers are these uh, double row columns, uh, and uh, those can be uh, um, uh, broken up into, into these uh, weight two uh, gauge operators. So uh, even though these are very, very large uh, stabilizers, um, we can infer their uh, value from measuring only two, uh, two parity checks. Okay, there are two important facts I want to uh, have you remember uh, for the rest of the talk. One is that uh, gauge operators generally do not commute. So uh, if you measure them uh, in some arbitrary fashion, the outcome is randomized. So let's say we have uh, four um, gauge operators. Um, we can measure values, let's say plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. This gives us the value of the stabilizer plus one. But there could be another pattern uh, that we get, and this pattern is, is random. Uh, the second fact is that um, even though we can have break these things, these uh, stabilizers up um, into like lower weight uh, checks, uh, gauge checks, um, we don't necessarily expect uh, a better performance um, uh, as the higher weight stabilizers offer less information. Um, and uh, also, uh, if any of the gauge operator uh, measurements uh, gives an erroneous result, then uh, certainly the uh, um, stabilizer result that we infer is also, is also incorrect. Um, so the first part of the talk essentially introduces a, a somewhat canonical method of, of breaking up stabilizers into gauge operators for some uh, classes of codes. And the second part uses these gauge operators to improve the decoding type of performance. Um, for the construction, um, uh, I will look at uh, uh, the hexagonal Tori code. So this is just like the, the old Tori code that you know, but uh, this time with uh, hexagons uh, on the uh, as faces. Um, uh, so that stabilizer checks are weight uh, six and weight three. Um, and I will, I will explain this uh, later in the talk why, why we made this choice, uh, but uh, the, the, Nothing, nothing else change, changes besides uh, um, the check weight. Um, so let's take a, a single Z uh, check, which is this hexagon, and let's uh, uh, look at uh, two X checks, uh, um, which are these vertices here and here. And uh, what we do is we kind of, we, we simply take these X checks and we uh, merge them into, into an, a single X check. So we kind of deform the letters in this, in this way but we still consider this to be a single face. So we just have like this kind of weirdly uh, deformed uh, face on the, on the torus now. So uh, 
this uh, operation is called merging. And if we are in the lattice, it kind of looks like this. Yeah? So this hexagon kind of becomes uh, this uh, bow tie shape. Um, but note that all the stabilizers still commute, um, which is uh, a bit weird if you kind of think about. Um, sorry. You do all of the opposite pairs in some sense. So you've got two blue ones on that hexagon. Yes. Haven't there been like two red ones or something that are also merged? So you can't. Um, and no, no, it's, it's, only, it's, only, uh, it's only these two. Uh, that I'm taking now. Uh, Only two of them, okay. Yes. Um, you will notice uh, if you uh, look at the, um, so the number of, of uh, logical degrees of freedom is given by the number of physical degrees of freedom minus the number of independent checks. And we just essentially removed an independent check. Uh, so we should, we should see another encoded qubit. And in fact, we do. Um, if you think of it uh, in a homological picture, so in the Tori code, uh, um, the logical operators are these uh, closed groups which can go around, which are not uh, um, products of faces. Then you see that there's uh, uh, one side of the bow tie which we can't um, uh, get from uh, uh, as a product of, of uh, single faces. Uh, so in some sense, this is a homologically non-trivial local loop. And note that this, uh, there's another loop on the other side of the bow tie, but this is uh, uh, this we can get by just applying uh, the phase operator here. Okay, so there's another operation which we call splitting. Uh, so let's say we have merged the stabilizer, then we can uh, break it up in a canonical way uh, by first of all um, breaking up the the x uh, check uh, in into its uh, former components, but now the the z check. Uh, also breaks up in a canonical way uh, because we have like this side of the bow tie and this other side of the bow tie. And I will consider these two, uh, uh, this in, uh, uh, decomposition uh, into, uh, into operators. And note that these operators do not commute. So for example, if we kind of take this guy and this guy, then they will overlap on a single qubit which lies on this edge. Um, so um, what we effectively did, we turned uh, uh, weight six and weight three stabilizer checks into weight three gauge checks. And if we do this all over the lattice, uh, then it kind of looks like this. Um, so we kind of now have a translation of bow ties. Um, if we move qubits onto vertices instead of edges, then it looks like this. And maybe people re recognize that this is uh, uh, already appeared in the literature. So this is um, uh, in work by Bravi, Dutrosino, C, Poulin, and Suchara. Um, this is the uh, subsystem surface code. Um, just to reiterate, so uh, uh, these are the, uh, this is what it looks like if you have qubits on the edges, and this is what it looks like if you have qubits on the vertices, where we have these stabilizers here in blue, which break up into two gauge operators, and here uh, uh, the X stabilizers, which break up into, uh, again, weight three gauge operators. Um, we can look at a uh, close cousin of the Tori codes, so called hyperbolic codes, um, uh, which have a finite encoding rate. So, depending on the uh, check weight, um, uh, we get a higher number of encoded qubits. Uh, we can do the same spiel here. Uh, we take a uh, phase, and let's say now we kind of merge uh, three uh, X checks, we get this kind of clover. Um, and by obtaining this clover, we, you can convince yourself that there are now uh, two independent gauge degrees of freedom that we introduced. And by doing so, we now have obtained a code uh, in, in this picture, uh, which has uh, a finite encoding rate. Uh, uh, so for nine uh, physical qubits, we get a single uh, logical encoded degree of freedom with weight three checks. Um, Right, so two gauge free per phase. Uh, before we had stabilizer weight three and nine, uh, and after uh, we had stabilizer weight all nine and gauge weight three. Uh, and these, this is what the uh, stabilizers look like. The uh, general construction um, can be seen in the in the tenor graph uh, of a, uh, of the CSS code. Um, so if we look at the single Z check. We can look at all the qubits uh, in its neighborhood and all the X checks in their neighborhood. Um, as before, we kind of find X checks, uh, and the way they are chosen is that they form a so called cut set, which uh, subdivides uh, the uh, qubit uh, set into two connected components. Um, and this gives us these, uh, this um, uh, canonical way of um, 
subdividing the Z check, and you can see that uh, this check will uh, um, intercommute with these. Uh, so each half will intercommute with these uh, X checks. Um, so first of all, we uh, uh, keep the number of logicals and number of physical qubits uh, uh, the same. We just uh, change the number of gauge uh, and independent stabilizers. Um, the bare distance of this code will stay the same. By bare distance, I mean um, if you just act on the logical degrees of freedom, then these operators will have the same distance as before. However, the, des the dress distance will generally suffer. Um, this means that if we multiply a logical operator with gauge operators, this can decrease the weight. And uh, it depends on the local structure of the code uh, and how these cuts it are chosen. Um, so there's no uh, like uh, one size fits all solution for, for choosing those. Um, there is uh, a necessary condition. So the X stabilizers should not overlap on the same qubits. And also uh, if, the, uh, if you choose the same X stabilizers for different uh, merging and cutting procedures, uh, you may run into trouble. Uh, very quickly, I would just want to kind of talk about um, uh, other codes. Um, so they are high dimensional homological codes. Um, they are, we can always find a canonical cut set, uh, the Petri polygon, which uh, subdivides uh, the Z checks, which are now on these three cells uh, into two components of qubits, which are on the faces. So you see it here in the cube or here in the uh, permutahedron. Um, uh, and uh, kind of merging these edges will kind of give you like two, two kind of balloons uh, um, of, of Z-checks. Um, I have a graph product codes. I just want to mention very, very briefly. Um, um, so there's a, a kind of shortcut to introduce those uh, using a topological viewpoint, which I want to advertise. Uh, we can take two classical codes. We can associate a cell complex to those. Uh, so here you see uh, two um, repetition codes where we put qubits on the uh, edges and checks on the vertices. Um, and if we take the cell complex and we uh, take a direct product of the cell complexes, we get a product space. So in this case, it's the torus. And this uh, product space defines a quantum code and this quantum code uh, inherits its properties uh, from the uh, cell complexes and therefore the classical codes that we put in. Uh, and um, yeah, by doing this, uh, we uh, can obtain codes with have finite encoding rate and distance scaling as the square root of n, um, which essentially kind of follows from the fact that code words here uh, turn into logical operators uh, in the product uh, quantum code. And these codes were introduced by Tillich and, uh, and Seymour. Um, I just want to mention this very briefly because uh, here is an example where uh, things can go uh, terribly wrong. Uh, so the surface code, uh, which I have like crudely drawn here is an example of this. Um, if we merge um, uh, X checks uh, diagonally everywhere, you see that uh, the, the outcome will give you a cell complex, which kind of looks like this, which is quasi one dimensional and which doesn't have any uh, distance growing with the, with the size of the code. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, we've seen how low check rates uh, Sorry, can you yeah. just clarify that last bit? It didn't quite make sense to me. She said that there's a way that you could do this cutting procedure. Which so, so what, what I want to do here is we have, take we take we take uh, x checks which are diagonally on each face, yeah, and I do this everywhere around the the square lattice on the surface code, yeah. Then uh, this x check becomes identified with an x check which kind of goes all the way on the diagonal down here. Okay. And uh, by doing so, we kind of get something which is like this, like kind of one dimensional, right? Um, so we kind of collapse the whole, the whole surface code. Uh, but there's another way to choose it so it's that this doesn't happen? Like um, so there's, there's a trick around this. I, I don't have time to talk about this, unfortunately. Um, the thing is, you can kind of turn the, uh, in this case, you can kind of turn the surface code into a surface code which has hexagonal faces, right, by introducing more qubits. Oh, okay. And, and then you're then you're fine. Uh, and a similar trick kind of applies to to have a graph codes as well. But I, I won't. I, unfortunately, I won't have the time to kind of go into these details. Uh, but I have to talk about uh, about it on Slack. 
Okay. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, um, uh, these weight three parity checks uh, may, be, may be natural in some uh, architectures. So there's work by Di Vincenzo and Solgun who show that this uh, you can actually facilitate weight three parity checks in uh, circuit quantum electrodynamics uh, naturally. Um, the support of the logic of is unaffected, uh, but uh, the logical plus gauge may be reduced. Um, Again, the caveat is that these gauge measurements have to be combined into higher uh, weight checks. Um, and this is a problem uh, because we do not expect uh, to improve uh, the threshold uh, by much. Um, so this is where the uh, gauge fixing idea comes in. Um, so the, uh, the uh, way uh, I'd like to think about gauge fixing is essentially by um, taking a, uh, a commutative subset of the uh, gauge operators and just add them to the stabilizer group. Uh, in some sense, it's just kind of changing our mind about what constitutes a, a stabilizer. Um, so kind of coming back to this, um, to this diagram, um, we uh, take, let's say, some uh, Z gauge operators and we kind of I know take them out of the uh, uh, gauge group then now they are adjoined uh, partners like the anti-commuting partners uh, of x type which are now commuting with everything in the gauge group yeah because we kind of took the anti-commuting pa partners out and now this kind of goes into the uh, the stabilizer uh, group uh, which is the center of the gauge group and this was introduced by Petznik and Reichardt um, to implement uh, logical gates. But here we will uh, use them to uh, improve the error correction performance. Um, and I will kind of demonstrate this with the subsystem surface code, but uh, note that this is a, a, more, general, a more general idea. Um, so this diagram on the left kind of shows how uh, um, the single measurement would work in the subsystem surface code. Um, the uh, dots are the two uh, gauge checks, which uh, make up a uh, 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 stabilizer check, which are these ovals. And uh, errors can occur on the edges in this diagram, uh, but there are no, um, so it's only, it's kind of cut off uh, to kind of not make this, this uh, diagram too busy. Um, the, uh, uh, in the vanilla scheduling, uh, the, we just alternate the X checks and the Z checks. Uh, and this randomizes the values of the gauge operators um, uh, because they might enter, enter commute. Um, so now we can, we can kind of put a uh, spin on this by um, considering schedules where uh, we repeat uh, checks uh, of the same type uh, for, uh, different, for several time steps. Uh, um, uh, after one another. Um, as I said, the uh, gauge operators of different types generally do not commute. Uh, but uh, importantly, uh, the operators of the same type uh, in, in following time steps trivially commute. So actually, we can use uh, these gauge checks as if they were stabilizers, because we know that their uh, um, values are not randomized. Um, yeah, and we can we can kind of uh, do this uh, for more time steps if, if, we, if we so wish. So we can kind of repeat the same polytype several times, and we can uh, uh, increase the number of time steps. And uh, by doing so, we uh, reduce uh, the average stabilizer uh, degree uh, if we if we average over the full uh, time. Um, we do uh, uh, some numerical simulation of this uh, in uh, uh, the depolarizing noise uh, uh, gate-based model. And we kind of uh, orient ourselves on these works by, uh, uh, um, um, I can't see because there's like a thing above it, but uh, it's uh, uh, Chamberlain, uh, Zhu, Yoda, Hertzberg, Cross, and Huang, Newman, and Brown. Um, so with probability of p, we um, have a single qubit idle error. With probability p, we have a two qubit uh, c naught error following a c naught gate. And ancilla preparation and measurement errors are kind of uh, the respective uh, fraction um, of their type. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, these are error models that appear in the previous literature. 
Um, there is a, a scheduling for the um, uh, uh, subsystem code, which was already in the paper by, uh, by Bravi and uh, Tichara and Poulin and Dutras um, C. So uh, if we uh, simply have the vanilla scheduling, so this can be noted as uh, set X. So this is just like the, um, the sequence of how we do our measurements. Um, then there's a, a schedule that takes four time steps to um, um, produce the, uh, uh, the checks um, using CNOT gates. And if we repeat um, a single type uh, several times, um, then um, uh, there's a slightly more efficient uh, schedule, which takes two time steps. Uh, note that, um, uh, which was also already um, uh, observed in the in the previous work, is because this is weight three and we have these uh, gauge degrees of freedom, uh, we do not have any Cook errors uh, uh, when we when we do these um, parity checks. Okay, we can consider three different types of schedules. So either ZX or we um, uh, um, repeat the same type uh, several times for the same number of times. Uh, and we get this plot. Actually, can somebody kind of uh, tell me because I kind of see like a, a weird uh, um, uh, box around this. Can you actually see the full screen or can you, is it kind of cut off on the, on the side? There is a strange green box, but I can see to the right of it. So. Um, okay. The top right of the plot, there's something that says Z, 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 X, X, and okay. then it's kind of half by a green line, but I can see the rest of it. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was worried that maybe it's kind of the green line kind of cuts things off. Um, I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, uh, okay, you can already see that um, uh, just uh, uh, changing the schedule um, here uh, increases the threshold um, by, by quite some margin. Uh, so here you see uh, um, the same, that's just keeping a qubit, uh, just looking at idle errors for the same number of time steps. Um, and um, note that there are two competing effects uh, which explain this. So first of all, we have uh, more idling errors, but then the average check weight per round is lower. Uh, so this is what improves things at first. But actually, if we, if we look at more than three repetitions, this threshold will, will decrease again. Uh, because of this, uh, um, because the adding errors will kind of take take over. And note that the threshold of the of the Tory code is at six point uh, uh, seven. Oh, what did I do? Uh, is here at uh, 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 zero point six uh, seven percent. Um, so you can actually beat the threshold of the Tory code here. Um, we also look at uh, uh, um, imbalanced um, uh, schedules, uh, by which I mean that we uh, uh, might want to repeat uh, uh, the checks of uh, one of the uh, polytype um, uh, more often than, um, than the other. So for example, here we do like a single Z check and then followed by two X checks. Um, and we can do this because maybe we want to gather, kind of gather more syndrome for one, for one polytype if we have biased noise. And uh, I, I would assume that this is an idea which has been around uh, for a while. So uh, um, if you have any more uh, references, then please let me know. I, the one I found here is by the uh, by group in Oxford and uh, Tsinghua, uh, which does this for, um, for iron trap uh, hardware. Um, Okay, the error model, uh, real quick, that we, that we kind of assume here is uh, uh, we kind of assume that uh, C errors uh, happen more uh, frequently with some uh, bias eta. So with probability PZ, uh, we have idle errors, uh, Z, uh, Z uh, two qubit errors, uh, and uh, ancilla errors. And uh, the same thing with uh, PX, but uh, PX now is kind of normalized in this way so that we get a total error probability, uh, which looks like this. Um, so here you see uh, what happens if we have infinite bias. Um, if we repeat the uh, uh, X measurements, this increases the, the performance significantly. Um, um, and uh, an upper bound of how much we can actually kind of gain by doing this is if we, if we just set uh, uh, X errors to zero and we only measure X gauge operators. So we now kind of 
forgot about like the Z part of the code and now we only uh, uh, consider the uh, three qubit uh, X gauge to be our, our classical code, then the threshold of this is 2.2%. Uh, um, um, so this was for infinite bias. Uh, if we uh, look at bias as uh, a threshold, as a function of bias, we can get this type of plot. Let me uh, explain this real quick. Um, um, the uh, idea is that we have the bias here on the, on the x-axis and we look at the total threshold uh, of the total error probability on the y-axis. You kind of see it kind of rises linearly here and then kind of falls off like this. Uh, so let me let me explain what this means. Um, uh, so first of all, if we set eta to zero, then the uh, uh, we get the value of the pure x threshold, and if we set eta to infinity, then we get the pure z threshold uh, of the code. Uh, there are two regimes. Uh, so this looks a bit funny at first because it's not non-continuous. Uh, sorry, this is uh, non-differentiable, but this is just because we uh, define the threshold as the minimum of the x and the z threshold. Uh, on the uh, on the left, we are kind of uh, limited uh, uh, due to the x errors, um, so we can uh, increase the threshold of the total error probability by uh, increasing the uh, z noise, uh, and this is this goes linearly in eta. Uh, on the right hand side, we are uh, limited by uh, z threshold, and um, and this then decreases with uh, uh, one over eta, uh, if we increase uh, z. Um, and just as a as a sanity check, uh, the maximum of the of the balance schedules, so z x and uh, uh, z two. So we if we um, uh, repeat z three times and then x three times, uh, their maximum is uh, at uh, at one, which which it should be uh, due to uh, symmetry constraints. Um, just to kind of compare what happens uh, uh, if we if we were not uh, gauge fixing, so here we have the same setup, but we do not use the information of the of the gauge qubit. So we kind of just just ignore the information and uh, uh, multiply them to be stabilizers. Then we get this type of uh, uh, of plot. So you can actually you can see that um, that the gauge fixing actually actually does help. So it's not like a, a a similar effect as, as I showed you before, uh, where um, um, uh, we just kind of gain something due to some statistical effect. Uh, and here is a plot showing um, how we approach uh, the um, uh, the asymptotic um, uh, z threshold uh, for for infinite bias if we increase uh, the x check. Um, uh, repetition rate, um, and uh, these are quite different. If we if we would not uh, use the this gauge uh, fixing idea, uh, and lastly, uh, let me uh, because we're kind of running out of time, I think um, uh, talk about uh, one other code, which is the this hyperbolic uh, uh, subsystem code. Um, here uh, we. Um, Construct uh, a scheduling uh, based on the uh, symmetry group of the of the code. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to kind of talk about this, uh, but I think this is the first time that uh, we have a, 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 an efficient scheduling of a, of a finite rate code. Uh, so this actually has the same number of time steps, so this is quite efficient. So we only do four time steps to uh, extract uh, all the uh, similar information. Um, uh, in the uh, in the vanilla scheduling, um, and each data qubit is adjacent to four gauge operators, so this is the best we can hope for. And as uh, in the previous example with the Tori code, we do not suffer from hook errors. Uh, and just as a as a comparison to the uh, to the Tori code, uh, let's fix the number of logical qubits. So we took one hyperbolic code, which is in red. Uh, which has uh, 338 uh, encoded qubits. And we look at several copies of, so we need 169 copies of the Tori code. Um, and we uh, look in the unbiased uh, depolarizing noise, uh, um, under, under unbiased depolarizing noise with the, with the vanilla ZX schedule. Um, 
and we can uh, say that log logical error occurred where if uh, any of the encoded qubits uh, was in failure. Um, then you see that the hyperbolic code with uh, 8,000 qubits has a similar performance to the Tori code with uh, either 32,000 or 50,000 qubits. Um, so just, this is just to kind of demonstrate that uh, these types of codes uh, actually outperform uh, the Tori code. And uh, by that, I would also kind of assume that they would outperform the surface code, which usually has a, a worse uh, um, uh, error, suppression, uh, error suppression properties. Um, and actually, we would expect that the improvement for unbalanced schedule uh, is even uh, is even better. I don't have the data yet um, to show you, but um, the the reason for having a low threshold in these in these high rate hyperbolic codes. Um, so I should have mentioned that uh, in these hyperbolic codes, there's a trade off between threshold and encoding rates. So we can have increase the uh, encoding rate uh, by increasing the um, stabilizer weight and um, uh, and but this we can pay for this by kind of decreasing the, the threshold. Okay, okay. Um, let me wrap up uh, with first time of talking about future work. Um, so uh, we talked about uh, schedules which were um, homogeneous in space, meaning we kind of did the same checks uh, all over uh, in our on our physical qubits. But one, one might expect uh, some improvements if, if we uh, uh, do this inhomogeneously uh, in space. Um, uh, and this might be informed by, uh, by let's say, hardware benchmarking. So maybe if you're, if you're more confident in, let's say, uh, one type of, of uh, you can just perform, uh, some views perform better than others, uh, then you might kind of tailor your, uh, scheduling uh, towards this. Um, it would be interesting to kind of check this for uh, like a larger variety of LDPC codes. So I kind of uh, focused here on uh, like Tori codes and uh, hyperbolic codes, which are kind of uh, close cousins. Um, but uh, like these kind of ideas are simple, but, but kind of general. So it'd be interesting to kind of see how this kind of works for other uh, LDPC codes. Uh, it might be interesting to kind of see whether this generalizes to non-CSS codes. So there's a class uh, of uh, non-CSS topological codes by Hector Bombin, which do not seem to kind of fall into this construction. So it would be interesting to see how they how they kind of relate. Uh, yeah, and kind of just kind of uh, run this with different decoders uh, than uh, the minimum weight perfect matching decoder that we used for the uh, toric and hyperbolic codes. Um, yeah, and as I said, uh, just kind of looking at, at wider classes of LDPC codes uh, would, be, would be interesting. Um, yeah, just in conclusion, uh, we have seen the uh, construction of uh, subsystem codes from CSS stabilizer codes uh, by breaking up uh, highway checks. Uh, we introduced uh, an idea of using gauge fixing in, uh, for scheduling. Um, I should also mention, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this, so Ken Brown, uh, has some related work uh, where he looks at uh, different gauge fixes of the compass code. Um, the, the difference of our work is that it's all done in, in, in software. So we, we always have the same code, and, but we just kind of use the information uh, in, a, in a different way. Um, and, and by doing so, we kind of showed uh, uh, that we can increase the, the threshold uh, quite significantly, uh, in particular if we have biased noise. Uh, and we introduced a finite rate system code with which three checks uh, and kind of demonstrated that uh, you can get uh, uh, reduced overheads compared to uh, Toric and surface codes. And I think I'm uh, now out of time. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Nico. I encourage uh, everyone to give Nico a virtual round of applause on the Slack channel. So we've got a couple of questions. So Ben Brown, do you want to ask your question live? I think you've got talking enabled. Hi, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, um, with, with your schedule, um, you, you showed a graph with the, do, are there idle qubits as you do that? Like it, with the wait for checks, you're good. Like all the qubits are busy all the time, but mm -hmm. does some qubits sit idle? Uh, so if you, uh, if you, um, 
if you you say if if you can repeat the the same type, you mean like this kind of like uh, uh, like repeated schedules, then then qubits do sit idle. Yes. Um, okay. Um, and, and how do these numbers compare to the wait for uh, surface code? Uh, just regular, like the the Simon Benjamin paper you, you mentioned. I, I didn't catch that number. If you, if you said. Uh, so so uh, this is the the wait for surface code number. So this is the oh. point six seven percent. So we do increase. Uh, we do. Uh, uh, um, oh, improve but, but I thought that. you I thought you said Simon Benjamin. Uh, he he tried repeating the same measurements. Uh, I, I misunderstood something. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a related question, which is just that, uh, you know, the torrent code has had the highest threshold for so long. In any talk where someone has a higher threshold than the torrent code, you have to ask, is there a catch? I guess for bias noise, you know, you have to have bias noise, and it's kind of well documented now that with bias noise, you can get higher thresholds. Although I don't believe I've seen anything that's looked at circuit level noise for bias noise yet. So um, is there a catch? Uh, as far as I know, no. And actually, actually, this is also true for non-biased noise. So if I can kind of, uh, sorry about this. Uh, uh, this also holds for. I realize it's also true for non-biased. That was the 0.67 to 8% number that you were claiming. Yeah. Uh, no, I can't. Oh yeah. Here we go. So you you can actually improve on it already for non-biased noise uh, if you just kind of repeat your. Uh, you uh, check several times. This is like this, this figure where you kind of, uh, where we see that this actually is optimal for imp kind of doing three Z checks. But this is essentially because of these like two competing effects. And uh, I, so I would want to be careful and kind of say this is like an artifact of the, of the error model in some sense, because we kind of weigh, uh, the way, the way that we weigh uh, the idling errors and the, the two qubit errors. Um, uh, they kind of just compete, and then this kind of shows gives you like this kind of this kind of result. Um, you the idling errors were a similar order of magnitude to a C not. Uh, so the the error model is just uh, this one. So you just have like uh, probability p single qubit idling errors, uh, probability p two qubit C not errors, and then uh, two. The p idle error is significantly less than a C not gate. Right. Yes. So so. Uh, so this might look differently uh, for for if uh, if you if you kind of uh, change change that, uh, but then maybe uh, whoops, but but then maybe you kind of still get an uh, advantage kind of kind of doing like the the double uh, 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 double scheduling. So what I'm saying is I would want to be careful uh, if uh, um, if you kind of change the error model here. Um, it would be less favorable to your scheme if you have if the idling errors are weaker, um, or more favorable. Or you uh, don't. One okay. second, wait. Sorry. Uh, so if we uh, I'm so actually I'm not sure. I I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think I can say whether whether one is more favorable than the other. Um, um, so. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a disadvantage. Uh, That's very promising. So you should also check that, I reckon. But can you also comment, um, sorry to hold the microphone, but I guess a lot of people that are listening maybe have in mind a 1% threshold for the Torrid code. So can you comment on why you're putting it? I think I know what the answer is, but just for the benefit of everyone that's listening. Can you um, putting it at point so, uh, so this is for uh, depolarizing noise. Um, mm -hmm. I think the one percent figure is for independent X and Z. Uh, is that correct? Um, so this is this is the the number that we I think uh, took from uh, Ken Brown's uh, paper. Um, I should have probably put the the reference. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I think most people find around 0.7 percent, but there's one or two papers that claim one percent. I think the noise models are slightly different. But. Yeah, yeah. So, so we made, we made sure that we have the same noise model as uh, as in the uh, Ken Brown and uh, Chamberlain papers. Um, and uh, Andrew Landau, do you want to ask a question as well? Oh, no, Nico is essentially. Well, <laughs> yeah, it was a question I asked in the middle of your talk. You essentially answered it at the end. You know, uh, in two thousand nine, uh, you know, Hector Bauman had these uh, topological subsystem codes that were pretty amazing. He was able to start with a color code and create another code, subsystem code that had just wait two checks. 
Um, but that, that code was not the subsystem version of the color code. It was some new beast entirely. And uh, I was wondering if you could use your methodology to come up with an alternative way of constructing his codes, maybe even generalized to LDPC codes. And, um, or, or it, I, maybe your method just always leads to subsystem versions of the original code you started from. Yeah, so I, I, I agree that uh, Hector's, Hector's paper is, uh, is quite amazing. And I, uh, I tried a little bit kind of, I know, uh, kind of brute forcing, uh, kind of trying fitting it into the scheme, but it, it doesn't really fit. Uh, and and uh, I also agree that uh, it's not it's not really the uh, the subsystem version of a of a of a color code. Uh, it's essentially kind of just using this uh, color code lattice construction to kind of create these this new class of codes. Um, yeah, I like to uh, call them the three fermion codes because the associated anion model has uh, three fermions uh, in it. Uh, yes. Um, so um, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't think I can I can, I can say anything anything uh, helpful about that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think I, I might I might still kind of uh, try in the future, but uh, uh, so far I haven't succeeded kind of, uh, um, kind of viewing it from this angle. Maybe I'll, I'll also just mention I, I was very impressed that you were able to reduce make the scheduling for the hyperbolic uh, codes much simpler with this. I know it's a very difficult problem, so that's a really nice application of this work. Yeah, thanks. So actually, it would be nice to kind of, I know, uh, generalize this even further to um, to other codes, which maybe have like a, a certain uh, to certain symmetry groups um, where this works. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're going to have to move on to the next talk. So if everyone can uh, thank Nico again virtually, and we'll move on to the next speaker. So thank you, Nico.